we have got a right bunch of people to ask the simple question is, is it an asset class? Is it really an asset class? Or at the moment, I'm trying to get rid of this microphone, um, it, or at the moment is it really just a, a kind of niche thing that doesn't quite sit in anybody's portfolio? Because a lot of institutional investors here, so you're a discretionary fund manager that, you know, in the UK. Where would you stick it? Is it an asset class? What is it? Simon. I definitely think it's an asset class, absolutely. And I guess when you, think, when you consider the origin of a loan, which was one guy lending money to another, yep. this asset class has existed many, many, many hundreds of years. Thousands of Thousands of years. <laughs> I think the only problem is over the last hundred or so years, the guy in the middle, the guy, the guy who was responsible for effectively making that loan, the bank, yeah. has become a very bloated piece of cost infrastructure between the borrower and the lender. Yeah. Um, making the returns to the lender unattractive and often making the loan expensive for the borrower. So, so the underlying asset class hasn't changed here. You're just delivering it in a much uh, fairer, lower cost and, and, and using technology, I think, a more, um, hopefully, a more profitable uh, methodology. Okay. But, um, so, um, Etienne, I'd be interested in your take on this. I think you've just announced a new fund today, I believe, uh, an Eiffel E-Fund, is that right? Yeah. We're, we, we are, uh, we've been a family office investing in this space for five years, yeah. and we figured it was time, because of the fact that it is now really an asset class, to, uh, to team up with, uh, with an institutional fund manager, which is a French, uh, large French institutional credit manager, and uh, we're going to be jointly investing in the, in the space. Uh, we're so starting. When, when, when you invest in this space, what are you going to tell your investors? What, what, what asset class is it then? Well, it is an asset class. Um, I, think, I think you have to think geographically, though. So clearly yeah. in the U.S., it's an asset yeah, class. Yeah, it comes to And it has you know, significant institutional interest, um, significant buyers, BlackRock, PIMCO, yeah. um, Eaglewood. Uh, in Europe, uh, you know, in so, some countries it is almost an asset class, and in other countries we're going to have to wait a little while. So um, UK is? UK, I would think, is, is an asset class. Anywhere else in Europe? Uh, not yet. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so it's the UK at the moment. Yeah. And, and, and interestingly enough, when, when you, it is an asset class, but where, do, where does it sit as an asset class within portfolio considerations? Well, look, uh, you know... I'm, is, it, I'm, is it pure credit? Is it's, it? it's credit, and, and I think I'd like to, you know, uh, talk to, to Jeff a little bit about this. Uh, you know, in his last presentation, he talked about the impact of rising rates. Yeah. Uh, as far as I know, we're in a deflationary environment, yeah. and I don't see anybody saying we're going to be not in a deflationary environment. I was about environment to say, on the continent, aren't they for, for doing quite negative some rates? Time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm not concerned about rising rates in the, in the next year or two or three. I think we've got a lot of um, repairing to do. So that's... Uh, so in a, in a zero or negative yield environment, of course, this is hugely attractive, and that's part, of the, that's part of the risk that you identified, which is that people searching for yield Swamp. are going to just flow into this thing once, once vehicles are created to, to allow that, whether it's equity-like vehicles or our vehicles. Uh, and I think we just have to be very careful about the flow of funds in, into this industry. And it's quite interesting, before I come to Peter, actually, we've got here a demonstration of three different approaches, actually, which is yours as the traditional... Um, institutional fund. Yeah. You're, not, you're not closed end. No. That's what I'm, saying, I'm trying to get at. So yours is you're trying to go after the kind of fixed income mandate guys, I guess. Yep. Maybe you're going after there. Uh, Simon is a closed end listed vehicle. Mm -hmm. um, big one now, 450 million. Absolutely, 450 million. So essentially, I'm uh, Peter PGI, the listed vehicle, is giving London equity managers yeah. the ability to access this asset class. Absolutely. And then, Jeff, you, you've got a kind of hybrid approach, which is that you've got the straight vehicle itself, which is DLI finance. But then, actually, which you put money on, on platforms in terms of equity, but you also then, sorry, in platform, I should say, I suppose, and you put money on platform in terms of loans. You do both. You take a bit of both, don't you? So platform yeah. black, you've probably got, I'm guessing you've got loads on platform black, and you've got an investment in platform black. Yeah, so, so about 30% of our assets are equity and 70% is loans. Okay. So, okay, so we've got varying mixtures here, but Peter, just coming to you, I mean, as Etienne was saying, in America, it is an asset class, yeah, and you do the, 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 you do the lended events, which obviously get lots of people coming to talk about as an asset class in the States. Where does it, so how, what are, how are institutional fund managers treating it in portfolio terms in the States? Are they looking at it as a replacement for cash? I suppose that, well, that's what's lurking at the back of my question is, is this really a, a replacement for cash? You know, kind of money market plus, one year duration, that kind of stuff, yeah? Or are people look, looking at it as a bit of their mix of 
you know, they've got, they've, got, they've got credit, so then they've got corporate bonds, they've got loans, they've got other stuff, they've got you know, asset-backed securities. Where are they putting it in their portfolios? Right, well, it's, um, it's certainly not a replacement for cash. No. Um, <laughs> I think that's, uh, that, that should be um, put out there right away. Yeah. Uh, I think, you know, I actually had a, we had a, a, a very um, vigorous debate on Lend Academy about, we actually put a, um, a post out about what, where does this as a class fit. And there, there really isn't consensus. Um, I think for the most part, it's really a fixed income yeah. um, play, and that's, I think, where most people, but some put it in, into sort of, put it in the equity bucket, because right. it behaves, it's, it behaves, the, like the, 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 yeah. there's, uh, there's, you know, a, um, a higher, a higher yield than, uh, than what typically fixed income has provided, so. Um, but, and also, it's high risk. If you look at, you know, just in Jeff's presentation just then, uh, I think there's, we, you know, this, while this is an asset class, the platforms are not tested and the platforms are, are still new. So I think that's why people put it in the equity bucket because it's high yield, but it's still, it's still untested. These platforms haven't gone through a downturn. So it's, it's, it's also high risk. Very interesting. I mean, from a UK perspective, that sounds like it's slightly closer to equity income. And, I, and I'm knowing, actually, well, I'm, I'm guessing I know people invested in both of your, so there are probably some equity income guys lurking around there. So does it really sit in equity income, Jeff, or is it, or is it really fit? Which, I, which in a UK term is what we call it. As, as, is it really there, or should it sit inside the corporate bond and loans portfolio? I think if, you, if you're actually doing the underwriting and you've got a, a solid platform that's got great backers, then it is, to, to all intents and purposes, just a fixed income asset that you're originating. It's a different type of fixed income asset than others that you'll get elsewhere in your portfolio, but it is a fixed income asset. However, there are a whole bunch of platforms out there that you'd put more in the, the equity side. Yeah. I mean, I suppose some reason I'm asking this is because if I went to, I talk a lot to fixed income managers like you all do, yeah? And if I went to a fixed income manager and I said, listen, um, I've got you a brilliant thing. I'm going to get you 6, 8, 9, 10, 11%, 9%, 9 yeah, 11 may be too much, uh, from a fixed income, yeah? They'd look at you like you're crazy, yeah? Because um, there aren't a lot of those fixed income things out there. I can't I remember looking at what EM bonds have gone down to, but they've probably gone down. It's, it's a bit, it's really, in that respect, it is quite risky, it's a lot riskier to go to Peter's argument about it's sort of sitting in the equity bucket, really. Yeah, you know, there's a, there's a very interesting, uh, one, one of our lawyers in the U.S. made the interesting point that um, is, this, is, is the underlying instrument that you guys are investing in, yes. it says debt. Yes. It's got a fixed repayment schedule. Yes. But if you look at the balance sheet of yes. the company that's borrowing, yes. you know, most people would say, well, that, sorry, that's equity. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Because, you know, if, it, if, if that company goes broke, you're, you're out of business. There's no underlying equity value, there's no balance sheet against yeah. it. Most of these are really small businesses. Well, what's also interesting is, is that obviously you, you make this assessment of is it debt or equity based on the yield, i.e. it's high yeah. yield, therefore it must be yeah. equity. I, yeah. I don't think that's necessarily true. The, yeah. the banks have made phenomenally attractive yeah. returns for the last 20 years out of credit cards. Yeah. You know, I looked recently at yeah, the last 20 years return for a credit card, unlevered returns of between 8 and 10 percent for a yeah. bank. Now that that is a phenomenally attractive yeah, unlevered return that. for anyone. That's a fixed, that is, that is a, 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 there's certainly not equity. The, the only reason you and I have never seen that is because it's hidden within a bank yeah. and most of that return disappears on their cost base by the time we see it. And what peer-to-peer -peer does to some extent is attempts to strip away that cost base and deliver the return. I mean, Peter, that's experience in America, isn't it? Because if you look at the really big lenders in America, it's in the consumer market, it's not really in the, the SME market. And, and, and Simon's right then, surely, isn't it? It's actually not that low risk, is it? <laughs> I've, I've, never main, I've never maintained it's low risk. Um, no, um, I, well, I'm, I'm, I'm obviously very bullish on the, on the space, but yeah, I think having the, you know, the, the investments themselves, um, I think the, the, consumer, the consumer market in the US, as you point out, it's several times yeah. the size of the small business lending market. Yeah. And, uh, and, you've, and that's even not even, not just taking in the credit card market Absolutely. versus a small business market. Yeah. Then you've got real estate, which is obviously a whole other yeah. uh, animal. But, um, you know, the consumer market, it's, you know, like you look at the, um, you know, if you talk about risk, 
the credit credit card um, portfolios, whereas they, in, they increased uh, increased defaults dramatically in the downturn. Um, you know, these these credit card portfolios are very robust, yeah. and they these companies they made eight to ten percent um, for the banks for for decades, and that's why that's one of the, that's one of the main reasons why I got into this business. I was so excited because I felt like that's kind of a that's robust income. That, that's something that we can get. Yeah, so it's it's you know, and particularly with with other alternatives, it's such. It's such a, a strong alternative. Rob, I want to bring you in at this point over at Platform Black because in a sense, I, I'm interested in exploring this idea about robustness of income and where it sits in people's portfolios. Yeah. I mean, arguably, the whole kind of short duration market, sorry, the, the invoice funding market is a very interesting market because it's quite short duration. I'm guessing average loan period, what, 60 days? Yeah, that's right. I, I think the, the, the dual aspect of high yield and short duration yeah. um, makes our, our product very attractive to inv uh, institutional investors. Um, and when you go and talk to them, where are they, what, where, where, talk me through, how are they looking at it? I'm sure you've been to talk to people like Simon and have a chat to through. Where, where are they putting it? Because I'll ask Simon in a second where he looks at it. Where, where are they putting it in terms of the way they look at stuff? Well, I mean, I, I, the answer is I, that's not really my job. So I talk to them about our product yeah. and they will, they will look at it as they choose to. I mean, we have two different types of products. So simple invoice trading, which ultimately recourses to the seller. Um, I'm pretty old fashioned about this. I, I consider it effectively debt, even if it is high risk. Yeah. Equity to me is something very different with yeah. effectively unlimited upside. Um, our buyer-led propositions, um, so supply chain finance, they effectively work out as an enhanced trade receivable, where you have a a promissory note. It's not a guarantee, but it's it's it, it's tantamount to a guarantee from a from a solid mid-market company, um, with the potential of of credit insurance as well. Um, I think that very much sits in the, in the high yield debt category. And that raises a fascinating question here, which is that I mean, the, 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 I can see why a lot of investors, to your point, don't know where the economy is going in the next two three years. They don't know where interest rates are going. Um, debate to be had. Surely shouldn't the weight of money just be heading towards short duration? I mean, because at the moment, the predominant model at the moment is three to five year money, even in consumer credit cards, and, sorry, consumer loans in America, it's three to five year money. Now, a three to five years is a hell of a long time to know what's going to happen in the next three to five years. Maybe we'll have QE6 by then, but, um, you know, we, there's, it's a very long time. Whereas actually, if I were an institution investor, I'd probably be saying, well, actually, and in fact, I do talk to institution investors quite regularly, and they go, you know, I'm really interested in that one year space. Are you? I think, that I th actually, you raise a really interesting point, is, is short duration because you fear risk, because you Absolutely. fear economic change of some description. I think, I'm, the, I'm right in saying the average UK corporate bond portfolio is about eight and a half years in length. Um, even lower. Probably, yeah. yeah. Our, our portfolio, even though we typically buy three-year loans, so we, as yet we haven't bought a trade finance loan, we're okay. still in DD phase. Um, but because the loans amortise, this is really important, because the loans amortise, over their three-year life, our average duration of the portfolio is sub one and a half years, it's something like 14 to 16 months. Now, to get a high yield, a strong yield, and a very short duration product is, is quite a rare bird. Yeah. Um, so I'm not, I, I think the shorter the better, I agree, but actually it's already incredibly short relative to the yeah. yield opportunity. Yeah, I get that. But Peter, in terms, what's your perspective on this? I mean, because actually if I, had massive, if I had uncertainty about the macro picture, it would be the US being honest, because, you know, if anybody's going to hoik the rate cycle, it's going to be the US, well, maybe we might not be far behind, but, um, but the US would be first in the rate cycle, the economy's looking pretty strong, and, you know, downturn can't be that far away if dollars are going to be very strong, and that's going to take a hit on those credit cards, and therefore, why would I want to be lending out of five years at the moment? And I think that that's a really good point, David, and, and, and as, but as Simon says, the, the five-year five loans don't have a five-year duration, um, and I know that there are plenty uh, of institutional investors, and maybe you're one of them, Simon, that only invest in three year for that for that reason. Yeah, yeah. That is, they, they don't want to take that 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 long. We certainly, risk. do more three year than five, but I think there are there are instances when five is okay. Right. So I think that having a, a, a like a, a much bigger mix of three year is is probably. I would say it's, it's predominant with most institutional investors. Jeff, I want to finish with you, actually. What's, sitting back and listening to this conversation, where are you putting your money at the moment in terms, of, you know, in terms of duration? What are you expecting in terms of yield? I mean, I'm right to say, Simon, that yours is expecting a yield somewhere between six and eight? 
our, our prospectus at IPO said six to eight, but I think my friends at Liberum think we're delivering above that. Okay. Um, Etienne, your new fund, some yeah, of the we're, range? We're in this, well, it depends. If you're looking at the US, I would say eight to 10. And okay. if you're looking at Europe, I would say six to eight. So Jeff, um, where would you say um, you're aiming at and the duration and the yield? Uh, in, the, in the eight to 10 um, range is what we're looking for in terms of yield. Um, and that's because we've got a large proportion which we'll be writing in the US versus UK and Europe. US produces higher yield than the UK, which produces higher yield than Europe. Um, in terms of duration, uh, we do have um, a weighting towards the, the short end because yeah. we've got invoice finance platforms um, in UK and Europe, um, two in Europe, and uh, we've got supply chain finance business um, in the US, and we've got trade finance businesses globally. So we'll tend to have a weighting, yeah, towards, sure. higher weighting towards uh, short duration. However, uh, we'll invest across durations because you've got to have a, you've got to have a diversity. Um, very last thing to you, to uh, Peter. Um, whereas in terms of duration and you, what realistically, if you're going into the US market now from a maybe European perspective, what should you, what's the best spot to be looking at at the moment? I mean, as far as duration goes? And yield, what you'd expect? Um, I think um, I think that eight to ten percent are still uh, are still doable. Okay. Um, I think that you know the rates are coming down. I mean, Lending Club has had a had a new rate reduction recently. Um, you know, Prosper has been doing them as well. So I think it's going to be at the lower end of that of that range. Okay. In my Brilliant. Guess. I'm going to jump in and say that we target a low to mid teens for all the investors out there, um, <laughs> with an with an average duration of about fifty to sixty days. Really? Okay, so. Uh, look, I, we could talk for hours, actually, this one. Uh, but we've got a busier day. Now, listen, these guys are now heading across into the, that room there. So if you want to ask some more questions of them, please do, because it's a very interesting um, session they've got there. Not that the next one here isn't. But thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you.